We're so honored that you joined us for this week's message here at Hope Church in Kalispell, Montana. Our hope is that you will be encouraged and challenged in your relationship with Jesus. Be blessed as you listen to this week's message. Again, I want to just take a moment to welcome all of you who are joining us online, our campus in Eureka and downtown at Hope City. We are taking a uh, short break from our Riptides message series. How many of you have enjoyed that message series and God has used it to speak to you, to challenge you, to bless your life? I'm excited to bring you the last message in that message series next week. Um, Today, we have a very special treat before I get into that. Um, I just want to reiterate, I am really excited to party with you guys on September 19th. 45 years as a church celebrating in this valley, that's a big deal. Uh, Especially today, um, there's so much happening in our world right now. And in particular, there's so many pastors that are resigning. And there's so many churches that are closing their doors. And in the middle of all that, um, God has been faithful to carry this church through for 45 years to make a difference and to bring hope to this valley. And um, there's no greater joy and privilege in my life to lead you in that. And I'm excited. On September 19th, we're going to have a good time together. We're going to celebrate the goodness of God. We're going to party. We're going to have some fun food. And... um, And I'm also going to get to share with you some things that God has put on my heart for this next year. Some very exciting news about some things that I believe God is doing and wants to do that you get to be a part of. So put that on your calendar. Don't miss it. It's going to be a fun, amazing day for us to celebrate the goodness of God together. All right. Also, um, this week begins our Connect Group launch for signing up for new Connect Groups. And we're about to go into the fall season and... I can tell you that my heart as a local pastor is that there would be more people that would be a part of connect groups than there are that attend on Sunday mornings. That is a personal goal of mine. I tell our staff and our leaders all the time, and here's the reason behind that. I believe that the American church has valued events and services over relationship. I'll say that again. I believe that the Americanized church has valued services and events for spiritual formation and discipleship over relationship. If you read your Bible, it's very clear that there's no getting around relationship. It says when the church was born that they did several things. They gathered, they forsook not the gathering together. They had relationship, they broke bread, they prayed. Small groups, connect groups are our way of doing that. It's your way of connecting with other people of faith, and you never know the relationships that God has for you. Some of the, still to this day, after 15 years have gone by, some of our closest friends, my wife and I, are from our connect group. And so I'm telling you, the world wants to tell you to isolate, and you could do this Christian faith on your own. It's not true. I'm here to tell you, that's a lie from the enemy, that I believe that James says that we are healed when we confess our faults to one another. There's something about relationships that bring more life to us and more of the life of Jesus and healing. Amen? I know I spent a little bit of time on that, but it's important. It's a big deal, and you're going to be hear about it in the next several weeks. So, all right, now I get the honor and privilege to introduce to you an amazing lady, I would say probably one of the highest Uh, compliments that I could ever give somebody is that they are a man or a woman of faith. And I can tell you that Tracy Evans, who is going to be our guest speaker today, is a woman of faith. She lives her life in radical obedience to Jesus and to faith in him. And today you're going to have your faith stirred up. She's an amazing missionary. She's really simply just followed the heart of God, been in 64 nations Um, Right now, currently serving um, Mozambique, Africa. Uh, Got crazy God stories of faith that are really going to stir up. My my heart and prayer this morning is that your faith would be stirred through her sharing all that God done. There's an amazing book that has been written about her life called Outrageous Courage. I highly recommend it. It's amazing. Gives you more of the story of your life. But would you do me a favor? Anytime we have a guest speaker, it's my heart that we would bless them as much as they bless us. Would you stand to your feet and give her a very warm, crazy Hope Church welcome for Miss Tracy Evans. Thank you. 
Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're going to have some fun this morning. Um, are there any YWAMers in the house? Oh, my God. I could tell. You could smell a YWAMer a mile off. You know? No, it's the fragrance of Christ, right? And... Um, I began my journey in, in YWAM years ago. As, as a teenager, I uh, received Christ in the army, and upon my discharge, I, I had nowhere to go. I mean, I had nowhere to go before I was in the army. I, was, I grew up in an inner city. My earliest childhood memory is uh, visiting my dad in prison, and then later visiting my brothers in prison, and it was just kind of a, a, a wild upbringing in, um, in Los Angeles. And I was a runaway when I was a teenager and lived in my car. And a drunk driver totaled my car, so I was homeless. I joined the army. I come to Christ in the army through the witness of another soldier there. And when I was discharged, I had nowhere to go, so I, I just uh, was camping in the woods behind the last post where I was stationed. And um, over time, I heard about this, this place called YWAM. Now, in those days, this is in the late 70s, and there were a lot of cults springing up in the States. Some of the older ones might remember the one about, um, you know, a thousand people that went to Guyana and they drank the purple Kool-Aid and committed, like, group suicide together. So I thought YWAM was one of these cults. And God was sending me there to set them straight. Now, I had only been saved a few months, knew almost nothing, the only clothes I had were my army fatigues. I knew nothing about registering or filling out an application. I just got the address and showed up on the first day. I'm here in my army fatigues. And, and this German woman came out to the parking lot to greet me as I pulled in. And she had a funny accent and came to give me a big hug. And I just decked her right there in the parking lot. Because I thought she was gay. And, I mean, the only physical contact I knew growing up was either a sexual pass or violence. So I just stepped over her and went and found out I was supposed to register, and they took me. They didn't know about the girl laying in a parking lot. <laughs> and I went and sleep in the, in, I was going to say barracks, in, in the dorms. I, I slept in my car. And, um, and it took about two weeks before I realized, yes, God had sent me to YWAM, but it was for me. I had no social skills. I was angry. I had issues. And, and they didn't quite know what to do with me. In those days, I mean, a lot of the other students were the pastor kids and such, and then it was me. And I got in a fight the first day in, um, they put me in the kitchen. I tore up the kitchen. So then they put me out in the field just moving these rocks around, <laughs> just from place to place, all by myself. And I would come to class, and I'd sit way in the back, you know, and I would listen, and I'd be so convicted. The speaker then, her name was Joy Dawson, and she taught about the fear of the Lord, and, and I was just learning that the Bible was the Word of God. I was just, it took me a few months, I, I just, if this is true, if this is the Word of God, then I've got to do whatever it says. So I wanted to make sure, and I'm reading it and studying it, and and, and she's talking about pride being the root of all sin. Now, I grew up where pride was a virtue. And in the army, you march around, you're the best, right? And, and now she's saying it's not only a sin, it's like the root of all sins. I am so convicted. And I would leave the class and go out in the field with my rocks, and I'd just lay in the dirt repenting, <laughs> repenting. And after a couple weeks, I apologized. I'm, I'm just glad they kept me. I'm glad they didn't pitch me out, because I would have pitched me out. So here's to the YWAMers. I, uh, I w took a drive through town the other day. I saw the, your base there, and I just, I was in YWAM about 10 years. And um, after I was able to travel through, um, I went to the Philippines, and I lived on a garbage dump with 20,000 squatters for about five years. And, oh, by then I was about 24, and I had never seen such such poverty it was quite overwhelming i remember the first day i went there were six men stripped naked tied up uh killed and thrown into a, the river there by by the dump and i ran back to the ywam base to report it go we've got to call the police and it go oh it's the police who did it it's the police who left them there and 
And it was, it was just a lot for a young heart to, to absorb. And I was on a medical team, and we would you know, do our rounds within the dump, and, and, and it, was, it, was, it was really life transforming. And at first, I go like, what have I gotten myself into? All I could see was the filth and the disease and death and flies. And, um, and then the Lord began to open my eyes to see the people, to see the treasures there, the little children. About half the children at that time died with our medical care. There were no vaccinations. The water was contaminated. There was starvation parasites. I just better stop there. <laughs> it, it was gruesome. And then we were getting sick too. But I, as I'm reading the Bible, I was reading about just God's great love for us. And I had a dream once that, that um, you know, we're called to count the cost when we follow Christ. And the dream was about Jesus counting the cost. He's with his Father. He's in heaven and glory and splendor. And Father says, like, will you go? And Jesus, as he, he comes to earth, and he's des as he's descending, it's getting darker and stickier and sweatier. And then he's birthed into a feeding trough in Palestine, occupied Palestine. And just in his dream, it was just like snapshots of his life. And uh, it wasn't, you know, we know about the cross and him laying down his life. He suffered his whole life. He suffered rejection everywhere he went. And yet he persevered. And, and um, he saw a treasure here. And we all know that, that he died for us because he loved us. But he also saw our worth and our value. We were worth it. A lot of you are parents here, right? Parents, raise your hands. A lot of you. What would you not do for your children? If a thief broke into your house, would you not throw everything you could at him? If a bear broke into your house, you'd probably run, but <laughs> no. It's just you would do what you could, and all within your power to the point of laying down your life, and that's what Jesus did. And so this morning I want to talk a little bit about treasure, and, and because we're all really at the core treasure hunters. We see what we value, we desire it, and, and we'll, we count the cost, and we do what we can to procure and secure and possess that treasure, whether it's a thing or a person. I mean, a lot of you guys saw her one day, and you just fell in love, and you worked your butts off at two jobs to buy that itty-bitty diamond ring. <laughs> and I know guys aren't into diamond rings, you know, but she is. And it's a token of your love and your affection. And girls, you did the same. You, you, you would just dream, like, how can I express my love to my beloved? And at one point, you exchange vows and you marry before, and you promise before God and all of heaven and all of earth. So we all know a little bit about this love that would lay everything down, this treasure that we have. And then you have children and you have one, and you give all your love to that one, and bam, she's pregnant again. With, and you go like, oh, I, have, I gave all my love away already to him. And to, but your heart grows. Your heart grows to embrace more, more people. Sometimes, though, we get distracted by fake treasures, false treasures. And we all know uh, those people who have just trashed their lives in pursuit of of treasures that had no value, whether it's drugs or booze or porn, or that get-rich-quick scheme, or that lottery ticket, and we, th we, we treasure it, but it's, it's really, it has no enduring value. And in the same way, there are lasting treasures, eternal treasures, that sometimes we walk right by because we don't value it rightly. And Jesus says, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? That's the real treasure. That's the treasure Jesus came for. If you took every diamond ring, every diamond mind, every ounce of pure gold, and you added it to every barrel of oil on the planet, 
And you added that to every acre of beachfront real estate and every work of priceless art on the planet. If you add that to every pirate's treasure buried in the deep blue sea, it would not suffice to pay for one's soul. It wouldn't. And yet, don't we chase after these things? That's how precious you are to God. That's how precious we should be to one another. That person next to you, your mother-in-law. Oh, did I just ruin it for you? (laughs) It's true, sometimes we don't see those treasures. And so I'm on this garbage dump and overwhelmed with the disease and I'm catching these diseases and and, um, and there was this little boy whose value I did not treasure. His name was Rodrigo, and it had been, I'd been there about six months, and I was so overwhelmed, I started closing my heart up to him, uh, to the people. I didn't want to learn their names anymore. I didn't want to make any friends because they were dying. And I was still doing my medical rounds and um, still doing my Bible studies, going through the motions, and I was not loving them. I was avoiding them. And there was this boy that was abandoned on the dump. He was itty bitty, he was hydrocephalic, had water on the brain, and you know, he's a lost cause. Uh, His family could not afford that surgery. They couldn't even afford to feed him. And um, I passed him by, I saw him there, I gave him a little something to eat and went on my way. And the next day he was still there, a little weaker, but still there. And I gave him something to eat, and I even gave him a little medicine and went on my way. The third day, he's still there, just barely alive, on a garbage dump. And I went home that night, and I had a dream about Rodrigo. I'm trying to put him out of my mind, but he came back in my dream. And I dreamt that that Rodrigo had died and that he was in heaven and in heaven he was whole and healthy and happy but for all eternity he had no memory of anyone loving him on earth and I just woke up sobbing because I realized I had a chance to give him a a memory that he could carry with him into eternity and that one day I'm going to see him there again And I was withholding that because I was protecting myself. So I got up and I ran back to his area of the dump. I had a little red knapsack and I I cut a couple holes in it and put some padding in there and I kind of just stuffed him in my backpack and just began to uh, carry him around on my rounds and took him home with me. And YWAM was just starting a little preschool there. Uh, And uh, they they took him in and just loved on him. And you know what? God healed Rodrigo. A shunt opened by itself. His hair grew in. His teeth grew in. He learned how to walk and to talk and to play. While others that I had hoped for, that that I had hoped that would live, that I'm investing in, measles came through the dump and wiped them out. We don't know. We don't know who's going to live and who's going to die or who's going to be who in our life. We just need to love that one in front of us and leave the rest to God. And sometimes we just, we're, we're so caught up in the present, we don't see the value of, of things that can, we can sow into one another's lives that would last for all eternity. And I am just so grateful for those few people that reached out to me when I was not very lovable, when I was hostile, when I was aggressive and even violent, and they just took me under wing and loved me. And it healed my heart. And not just being able to receive from someone else, but then being able to share that love with others. Now, right now, I the last 20-something years, I've been in Mozambique, and I just went with the back, but I didn't want to go to Mozambique. I had been in Asia 15 years. My heart was there. I had learned a language and a culture, And that's where I wanted to be, but I'm from Bethel Church, and um, um, my pastor, Bill Johnson and and Chris, they go like, hey, you know, we want to send an outreach to Mozambique. And in those days, Mozambique was just coming out of a brutal civil war, 16 years of civil war, 
where even family members hacked each other up. And before that, 450 years of, of, of colonial oppression that just kept them at slave level. And before that, hundreds of years of the Arabic slave trade. The World Bank classified Mozambique as the poorest country in the world, not just economically. I mean, there were landmines everywhere. And I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to take a team of, I mean, at that time, the students were 18, 19 years old, never traveled, as green as can be. And you know, if they have a bad outreach, who do they blame? The leader. <laughs> I didn't want to be that person. And I had never been to Africa. I didn't want to go. And I tried to wiggle out every way you could imagine. And I fussed and argued with Bill and Chris for five months. And I said, if God shows me, I'll go. But just you know what happened? Heidi Baker came and spoke in our church. <laughs> the first time, wild as all, as she does. Ah. And so they go, well, take a team to her new orphanage in Mozambique. And as I'm researching, I'm going like, I am not going there with a bunch of kids. And um, so I go, if God shows me, I'll go. Well, he did. But I was still dragging my heels. And so it came, we, we had a team together. Oh gosh, I don't know, about 22, 23 people. We had our airfare, we had our outreach fees. And it was several thousand dollars. And just before we bought our tickets, Cyclone hits Mozambique, tens of thousands. I mean, crocodiles were eating people. It was horrible. And now I <laughs> even more don't want to go. And I had the team together, and I go, hey, come on, guys, really think about it. We don't know the language. We don't know the culture. We only, you know, we'll be 10 hours jet lag just getting there. What use are we going to be? Why don't we call up Heidi and offer her our outreach fees instead so she has some money to address the, I mean, she had 500 kids in a field, orphans. Just give her the money, and, and if, if we call her and ask her, and she says, yeah, would you? It's about helping Mozambique, right? It's not about our, our mission trip. And so they agreed. So I called her up. I put her on speakerphone, explained the situation to her, and she goes, well, let's pray about that. So she prays, and I'm sure she's going to go for the money. If you had 500 kids, what would you do? And um, she goes, no, someone on your, you need to come. Someone on your team's going to stay long-term, and we need some long-term people. Well, I'm looking around at them, going, you wouldn't want any of these. <laughs> well, it was me. <laughs> I didn't clue into that till I got there. I saw the harvest. The harvest was ripe. I brought the team home. I kept them safe, and I went back. And uh, over time, I, I, uh, a friend bought me an old beat-up truck, and I went out into the bush, and I had a, a couple nurse friends with me. We just did bush clinic out at the back of that truck. I had two Mozambicans. They both spoke eight languages each, and we just started evangelizing, discipling, church planting. We planted 22 churches, <laughs> raised up local leaders. It's not me. It's just that's how hungry they were. <laughs> hungry people will eat anything, right? Physically and spiritually, they are so spiritually hungry. And if the Muslims get there first, they become Muslim. And if the witch doctors get there first, they get into witchcraft. And we are racing the clock. And so the need at the time, the critical need, was um, there was just mass starvation because of these cyclones that would just rip through the country and flood it out and ruin their crops. And... Um, Moms were dying like flies, and if a mother was still breastfeeding, they would bury the baby with the mother, bury the baby alive. And like, I'm single, I've never married, I don't have kids, I'm not really a kid person, you might have guessed. <laughs> I'm more like a drill sergeant type. And, um, but I had this South African nurse that was with us, and she had that mama's heart. You know, and, and we were just living in tents, but uh, people started, the grannies and hu husbands and stuff, the moms would die, they would bring us a baby and say, put this baby in and start an orphanage. But I had already seen some orphanages in, in Africa, and what happens is, is the white people that start these orphanages, you know, missionaries, but then the child doesn't grow up in their culture or their language. 
they learn to read and write, but at 18 years old, they, they don't know, the girls don't know how to carry 50 pounds of wood or water on her head or hoe a field. And, and so the villagers don't want them back. They have to leave the orphanage. They have no place to go. And these Christian kids would end up in prostitution and crime. So it's, orphanage is certainly better than perishing. And, and God moves in his ways as he does. But we say, well, what about, we prayed, God, give us a, a plan. How, uh, give us a strategy. And we decided we'd take these kids and we would covenant, uh, we would contract, rather, with the, um, with the tribal people that brought us these children. Go, hey, this isn't my kid. This is your kid. So we will help you. They want their kids. They love their kids just like you do. But they had no hope without milk. So I would take that truck and go into South Africa and buy, gosh, I'd buy a ton of powdered milk and formula, bring it back across the border, and they would appoint a caregiver from among their family members to bring that child to us. And we would do a well baby exam and treat the, the baby and the caregiver. Sometimes the caregiver is a 12-year-old sister, and she's the head of the house. Both parents are dead. Or she would have a 105 fever and, and with malaria, so we would take them in for a while and for a few days or weeks to get them healthy and then send them back out. But then that child grows up in their culture, in their language, has inheritance rights, and then we could go visit them in their grass shacks or mud shacks in their villages. We have tremendous favor because we saved a child's life and we could plant a church there. So that's kind of how we rolled out. That was, we started the current baby program about uh, 11, 12 years ago. We've saved over 8,000 babies. And yeah, it's fun. It's fun. But then another problem uh, arose. Uh, now we have 8,000 toddlers running around. What do we do? <laughs> so we started preschools and kitten gardens and the Votex Center. And we got into prison ministry and agriculture, just whatever the need was, just practical ways to express God's love to people. And then they would just come and surrender their lives to the Lord. And it just began to spread like wildfire. So that's how I ended up in the place I never wanted to be. But you know, you've prayed that God use me, send me wherever you, and I'm thinking Caribbean, Hawaii. <laughs> but most of the countries I've worked in or lived in, they were uh, closed countries, communist. My medical credentials could get me in. And um, communist countries, Muslim countries, and, and where it's illegal to, to assemble like this and, and to worship out loud. And, and, and we would see God come through. He would lead. He would provide miracle after miracle. And also times when you're praying your guts out and it, that kid doesn't get healed and dies in your arms. And, and what do you do with the grief? And, and, and the times where you're just so disillusioned sometimes. And we've all been there. It's just, I had illusions about God and about church and about missions and about myself. Wow, I discovered I wasn't nearly as spiritual as I thought I was. <laughs> but I needed that. I mean, I don't want to stand before Jesus on that day and find out half my Christian life is fluff. It's not even real. It's just my uh, culturizing, Americanizing my faith. Or I, I, There used to be a show on TV when I was a kid. It was a game show. It was called the Tell the Truth, and they would have like three pilots, up, well, a pilot and two fake pilots up there, and the contestants would ask questions and try to determine who was the real pilot. And then after a while, they would vote, and then the real pilot would stand up. Well, it's kind of like that with Jesus. There's a lot of fake Jesuses out there. Yeah. And I, I go, if you have a fake Jesus, you have a fake salvation. If I want to get anything straight in this life. I want to know the real Jesus. And when I see him on that day, I don't want to say, hi, I'm Tracy and you are. <laughs> you know, I want to recognize him because I know him. And, and, and so as I'm a young Christian and launching out, I'm, I'm finding out what's real in my life and what's fluff and what's real in my heart and, and, and what's not, what's pretense or posturing. Because 
you know, and I was praying. I go, God, I want Jesus. I want to know the real you. And he spoke so clearly. He goes, I, I want to know the real Tracy, too. And because we all, like, put on a mask for our families or our friends or associates. Who's the real you? And, you know, the only way we can find out is by first finding the real Jesus because we're hid in him. We just find him, we'll find ourselves. And, and you'll know who you are and whose you are. You'll know what gender you are. You'll know, you'll know the most basic things in life that may confuse you now. I want to know the real Jesus. And the more I find of him and the more undone I am, I, I found a treasure that lasts forever in him. And it trumps any treasure this world has. And, and when you fall in love with someone, you kind of fall in love with the things they love. I had this girlfriend once. Her name was Mary, and she loved baseball, knew all the stats. And that's kind of unusual for a girl. And I go like, Mary, how did you get so into baseball? And she goes, well, I had this boyfriend. And he was into baseball. So she got into baseball because he was into baseball. And the relationship didn't last, but she still loves baseball. <laughs> because it, we rub off on each other. And um, Jesus loves souls. And I'm so grateful for how he, he made room for me when I was so unlovable and unapproachable and he, he just worked his way into my heart and then I started falling in love with souls too and seeing the true value of, of one soul I mean it's so precious that when one sinner gets saved all heaven in its splendor and glory and majesty it stops to rejoice over that one that's how precious it is and sometimes we can get so distracted from that I mean Lost souls, I, I mean, I, those people who have never had the opportunity to hear the message of salvation, who have never tasted the sweetness of his goodness or his grace, those people that are just enslaved with addictions and, and the, the snares of this world, those people who sit in pitch black darkness of, of their own shame and guilt, not knowing that there's freedom within arm's reach. Uh, you know those people, because you were one of them too once, right? I was. And I'm so grateful for how he, he reached out to me. And then he says, freely, freely receive, freely give. Do you freely give? Do you share of the blessings? A, a lot of times we just try to, we gather it all up, but we, we kind of forget to share sometimes. And I know why. It's especially with sharing the, the good news of God's great love. You're faced with a lot of rejection from your neighbors, your coworkers, your classmates. A lot of people, because they live, they're still in that pitch black darkness. And sometimes they, it takes a while before they can see the treasure that's before them in the words, that you, the words of life that you have to share with them. So I said, Jesus, I'll share. I'll go where you say go. And I have no regrets. I had four proposals over the years. Lost all of them over missions. In the end, the guys just said, no, I can't do this. And I go, well, I would be a terrible American housewife. I'm just sure I'd be a husband beater. So I'm just <laughs> going to let it go, let it go. What do you mean I can't go? I'm just being honest with you. I still have some rough edges I'm working on. Maybe I just scare them off. I don't know. <laughs> so, what's your treasure? What's your alabaster vial? What's your widow's mite? Would, would you wash Jesus' feet? with your tears and dry them with your hair. Remember the woman who poured out her alabaster vial. The disciples even criticized her. And Jesus says, stop, leave her alone. She's done a beautiful thing for me. And he said, wherever the gospel goes, this story will go with it. That so touched his heart. He, he didn't say that of healing the sick or raising the dead. 
He said, this story will go with the gospel because that's what the gospel's about. God's radical love for us, his radical love for all the world. And there's a lot of places, I mean, I have, I've worked or traveled through or smuggled Bibles through 64 nations now. But there's a lot of countries that I just, I have a heart, I have a heart for Afghanistan, always have. But I'll never, I don't think, get to go there but I have a couple missionary friends, a couple families that are there. And so I'm, I'm a missionary and I support half a dozen missionaries <laughs> because I believe in what they're doing. And I know what it costs for them to go there. And so often, you know, people leave and they go and it's out of sight and out of mind, but they're not out of God's sight and they're not out of his mind. And I go, God, whoa, what do I have to share? whether it's time and volunteering to work with the children, to, to sow seeds into the young of this church and this community. And I just think there's, there's so much power in a little seed. And you sow your seed and it's underground and you don't see it and you think, did it do any good? Well, there was a soldier who sowed a little seed into my heart a long time ago. And I poured concrete all over it but it broke through. When the conditions were right, it broke through. So I want you to think about, about those treasures you have. Are they real treasures? Is it the real Jesus? You'll know by the fruit. What fruit is your life producing? That's something you can judge. You judge by fruit. Is there love for that cantankerous neighbor whose tree is overreaching your fence and littering your yard? Or tree, uh, is, is, do you have love towards that, that person at work or at, at class that just annoys you to no end? There's a human soul in that person that has immense value to God. And God is searching as, as his eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth, seeking him him whose heart's completely his, that he may strengthen him. He's just like, who can I find to share with this one or that one? I had a patient once in the hospital and uh, when I was working more in nursing and, and between shifts you have about a half an hour overlap where the old, uh, the, the shift before you give you the news on the patients before you go out on the floor. And there is this one woman, her name was also Mary. If there's any Marys in here, I'm sorry. <laughs> there was a Mary that had Jesus. <laughs> so her name was Mary and she was all arthritic from head to toe. The only thing that moved was her mouth and it moved incessantly. And she would curse us and we'd try to clean our teeth and she would bite us and spit. And so we would kind of gamble and I, like, I'll take three patients if you take Mary. And we were always trying to get rid of Mary. And Jesus spoke to me and says, will you love her? I love Mary, will you love her for me? And so I volunteered every shift. I go, I'll take Mary. And I would clean her and powder her and brush her teeth. And then I reach down and kiss her on the forehead and say, Mary, I love you. Jesus loves you. And she would spit in my face every day. Went on for weeks and even months. Well, one day I'm cleaning her up and she's not making a sound. She's just staring at me. And I'm singing her a song as I would do. And I kiss her on the forehead and a tear came down her cheek and she says, I love you too. And she received the Lord. It's worth it, right? It's worth it. It's worth it. And on that day when I see Jesus face to face and I see all those scars and every scar saying, I loved you this much because I put those scars there. I want treasure, real treasure, to lay at his feet. I want to store my treasure in heaven where rust and moth don't corrupt, where thieves cannot break in and steal. Because on that day, I want, I want my alabaster box, my widow's mite, whatever it may be to lay at his feet to a token of my great 
appreciation for all he's done for me. So just think for a moment, what are the things you treasure most? And are they real? Do they have lasting eternal value? Or maybe not. What do you have to set aside to make room for, for real treasure? Have you thought about what you want to lay at his feet on that day? Father, may we be among those that are rich in the things of God, rich in the treasures that have eternal value. May we be among those that have something to show for our lives that last through the fire that consumes wood, hay, and stubble, and something of true value that we can lay at your feet. Help us to see through the smoke, through the smoke screens that the world surrounds us with and help us to remember that you're, you're right there within arm's reach. And yet you know how easily is that we go astray as sheep or how easily we get distracted. Just by your Holy Spirit right now, would you just blow away the smoke? And teach us how to invest in ways that please your heart. And Lord, give us courage when the people we love and friends laugh at us because of how we run hard after you and it makes no sense to them because they haven't esteemed treasure rightly and they just don't they don't get it Lord help us to to just forgive them and get on with pursuing you wherever your spirit leads us and when we breathe that last breath May it be with no regrets of how we spent our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us the way how to do that. Thank you for laying down your life for us. Thank you for thinking that we were worth it. And for not giving up or turning away. in our eyes so that we can see that those near us are worth it too and that those far away they're also worth it Amen Thank you for joining us for this week's message from Hope Church If you enjoyed this message you can easily support the ministry of Hope Church at hopechurchmt.com slash give also follow us on social media at Hope Church MT. Be blessed and have a great week.